Nominations are now open for the 2017 Bioceuticals Integrative Medicine Awards, the Beamers. As healthcare practitioners, we care for our patients and while our therapies can have a major impact on them, there are few opportunities for us to celebrate our success stories as a profession. Now is the time to have your contribution to integrative healthcare recognised. There are many different categories and, as usual, great prizes to be won. For more information, go to the Education tab at bioceuticals.com.au. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me on the line today is Emrys Goldsworthy, who's the Director of Athletica Physical Health in Brisbane, Queensland. He completed a Bachelor Health degree in Health Science Musculoskeletal Therapy, which he attained at Endeavour College of Natural Health, formerly the ACNM. He's also gained a Master's degree in Sports Coaching, focusing on Classical Ballet Coaching at Griffith Uni. Emrys has been a lecturer since 2008 and currently holds a position of senior lecturer of the Department of Musculoskeletal Therapy at Endeavour College of Natural Health in Brisbane. Emrys' interest in the body began when he was a professional classical ballet and contemporary dancer. He's a graduate of the Australian Conservatoire of Ballet, which led to a career in the Royal New Zealand Ballet, performing several soloist roles and touring the world with the company. Emrys has a unique approach in the examination and treatment and physical impairments. And today we're going to be talking about something that is greatly interesting me, and I've got to say I am totally ignorant of, and that is working with the vagus nerve. So welcome, Emrys, to FX Medicine. Thanks for having me. Emrys, I've got to say, I feel like a dunce with this. The only vagal nerve stimulation that I'm aware of being a nurse is the sort of more medical stuff where they implant an electrode, but I'm getting the gist that we're going to be talking about something completely different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. First, firstly, though, I'm very interested in your background. Um, yeah, so originally I was a classical ballet dancer with the Royal New Zealand Ballet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up retiring uh, to come back to Australia and move on to a new career, and I... I did my Bachelor of Health Science in Musculoskeletal Therapy and graduated, uh, moved into lecturing and clinical practice after that in 2008. And at the time, I was lecturing but also just sort of specialising in dance injury management and just normal uh, clinical work. And it, didn't, it wasn't until much later that I, I started to get a bit more interested in the nervous system. Mm. Uh, at the time, it wasn't. It was just a small part of the uh, way I was thinking uh, as far as injuries were concerned. And then I found, I started learning a lot more about chronic pain and neuropathic pain, uh, which led on to, you know, thinking, talking in, uh, in class and about it and, and learning more about neuroplasticity and being inspired by a lot of authors in these areas. Um, eventually that, that moved on to, some interventions that were out there, uh, neurostimulation, uh, photobiomodulation, also known as low-level laser, wow. and l- vagus nerve stimulation. Mm. Uh, vagus nerve stimulation was a, an interesting sort of thing for me. That's, uh, that came about quite organically over the last few years, uh, and I was really surprised that not many people were talking about it. Um, you know, you hear a lot about the the gut to brain axis, and yeah. and that's you know that's what you'd hear from all my colleagues in, in ultra- naturopathy and clinical nutrition. Uh, and then I started hearing about the brain to gut axis, and I thought, oh, okay, this is interesting. Maybe I can assist some of the naturopaths with my nervous system work, because everything I do as far as nervous system work is really not to do with you no know, um, supplementation or anything like that. Mm. It's all physical yep. approaches, yep. manual approaches. And I thought, well, how can I assist in this? And I, I read up more on it and found that it was really relating to the way that the vagus nerve impacts on gut health and reducing gut inflammation and a range of other things. So, oh, okay, it's more than just stimulating the, the muscles of the gut. It's a bit more than that. And when you go in depth into this, it, it you you get shocked at how much the vagus nerve does 
way more than you learn at uni. Mm. Uh, and, and it kind of it gives you a bit of an idea of how important it is. Uh, so when it's not functioning very well, yeah, that's when you start to go, ah, maybe maybe we can do something about that and maybe it'll have a big impact on. Firstly, it was for me for just gut problems. So that's where it started. I thought, okay, vagus nerve, gut problems, there's a link there. Uh, maybe we can stimulate in some way. Mm. So, I mean, the vagus nerve to me, like from what I remember from nursing, you know, it's like it was the peculiar cranial nerve that went outside mm. the cranium. That's you know, right. you know? Um, yeah, and, it, but the only real, uh, you know, medical interventions of of the va- or to the vagus nerve were basically dissection um, to stop things mm. like nausea or um, indeed there may be some impart in um, vasovagal stimulation, that sort of issue. Yep. Yeah. So vagotomy is a is a real thing you read a lot about in the literature, and mm. I mean a lot of that stuff for me is important in understanding what it. When, it, when you have that, what goes wrong after and all the side effects of that Yeah. as to know whether you yeah, know, it wasn't that's a, why sometimes stimulation is important. Mm. It wasn't a nice therapy in any way, shape, no, or form. No, no, no. Well, that's, you know, that's completely so far removed from what we the research is where it is now. And mm. the, the other stimulation device is called the implanted device for yes. um, recalcitrant uh, epilepsy. And, of course, that's being utilized by a fair amount of people in the United States. Wow. Um, most of the research is done over there. and. They're getting great results. The, there's some side effects to it. They're, they're the usual things yeah. when you play the device, like yeah. you know, infections and, and the like. But uh, a lot of the research is done on that particular device. But the emerging field is what's called transcutaneous mm-hmm. or non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation. And so that's where I sit. Great. So I've I got to say, like you, you said, when you started to learn about, you know, let's call it transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation, when was this, and, and, and has that research yep. evolved since when you first learnt about it? Yep. So uh, a few years back, I one of the first things I started to do was utilise some exercises that activated some of the motor output of the uh, the vagus nerve. Uh, and, and that was really things like gargling, uh, sometimes singing, um, because vagus nerve is involved in um, vocalisation, and also in gargling and the range of all the muscles of the back of the throat. And so there were some things we could do in that way um, for take-home exercise. Uh, but the, the whole idea of electrically stimulating it, well, we started with electrically light electrical stimulation through the neck where the axons run. But I always knew this was a problem because from my background, in, um, I do a lot of work in, in neuroscience. I teach neuroscience here at Endeavour College. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's my main area of sub expertise. And I knew that it didn't make sense for me to stimulate it along the axon. And the electrical stimulation of a nerve starts at one end and ends at the other. It's not meant to occur Half along the axon. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. And so I always found that the idea that they were stimulating it along its axon to be not based in, you know, in the neuroscience uh, of it. So I, I thought we need another way. Is there any other sort of, uh, we call it sort of, end organ, which is like the receptor, receptor zones or sensory zones that the vagus nerve um, accommodates. And we found, oh, of course, that the part of the, in, the, part of the outer part of the ear uh, is vagus nerve innovated. And I thought, oh, interesting. And then I did some wow. research. And it turns out there's a body of people, a body of work, a lot, you know, at least thousands and thousands of papers on, on auricular transcutaneous um, vagus nerve stimulation. And you would never know about it. It's, uh, it seems to be, and it's occurring at pretty reputable co- uh, universities across Europe and America, and this just led me on, a, on a, a completely different track, and I started looking into doing auricular stimulation and played with different frequencies and different uh, approaches to stimulation. So we have one type, which is um, electrical stimulation through um, filiform needles. They're the ones you use in dry needling and acupuncture. Mm-hmm. So you can use them to put the needles in the ear and electrically stimulate via them. Or you can use electrostimulation um, devices like TENS machines and things. And the the problem is with the ear is that it's quite a small area and the actual vagal innovation is quite small. And if you want to get more effective with it, you need to make your own device. You pretty much have to start from scratch. So that's why we tended towards more needles uh, because you can really be accurate with them. Yeah. I was looking at a um, a device, and forgive my ignorance, okay, because 
I ain't an expert in this at all. But I was looking at a, an, a, a device that basically looked like, almost like a clip that you clipped yes. onto the Oracle. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of the research is done with clips on different parts of the ear. And yep. one particular study was fantastic. It got uh, in, the, in the sham, they had it just on the outside part of the ear, which is the um, trigeminal nerve. And then on the conca was in the actual group that they were testing, which is the vagus nerve, which is the inner portion. That was, uh, they found that the one that was done on the conca actually activated, and we'll talk about its effects, mm. all the effects of the vagus nerve, all the antidepressant effects and all the um, brain regions lit up dramatically in functional MRIs. But then the one on the outside part of the ear, they had no effect. Right. So it's amazing how different different parts of the ear and how, how different effects it has on the brain, mm. uh, which is quite shocking when so, you would consider that the vagus nerve looks more like a gastrointestinal heart and lung kind of nerve. It seems to be have a lot of brain effects as well. Yeah, so this is – well, I'll ask you about that next, but uh, can I just clarify something? Am I getting this right, that the place where they stimulated would just below that sort of horizontalish ridge in your ear? Is that right? In the middle part of the ear, just, just, just close to the external auditory meters – and so the upper and lower part of the conca, which is the centre part, upper um, and lower. Have a look on. Gotcha. The upper and lower, but there's recent research today that the most densely innovated area is the upper portion, which gotcha. unfortunately in most people is the smallest area. Right. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Tricky for clinical, yeah. I remember looking at it, going, "Wow!" But anyway, so I, yeah, for our listeners and for me, please, you know, apart from the obvious that we learnt in, you know, and that phys 101, can you take us through? the actions of the vagus nerve, because it just seems to be so much more than what I thought it was. Yeah, so I'll take you through some of the basics. So, of course, mm. it's the main parasympathetic nerve. And a little word of sort of warning, when you learn about you know, this, is, this unfortunate thing that they get, people get taught is that essentially when your vagus nerve is really active uh, or it's healthy and working higher than it, it used to be, they think that it's going to overly lower your heart rate. You're going to go into bradycardia and you, you're going to have lungs that you can't breathe properly because your, your breath rate is so low or one of the your controls. gastrointestinal motility will go too much. You know, It doesn't really work that way. No. What it really does, when it's active, it more modulates everything. It more can, sort of brings it back to a homeostasis, you could say, because really all it's about is the after effects of the sympathetic response, You know, the fight or flight response. Mm. That parasympathetic response is all about returning it to normal. Uh, you know, just sort of down regulation yeah. uh, rather than complete suppression. And yeah. I think that's very important. So you see a lot of that, I, a lot of people talking about, oh, if you stimulate the vagus nerve too much, won't you get this effect or this effect? And it doesn't really work that way. It, it's not really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. So, so some of these are, of course, increasing, it, it increases gut motility and um, contraction of smooth muscle cells in the gut lining. Uh, it's also involved in regulation of heart rhythm. So it tends to lower the heart rate but modulate heart rate. It's involved in swallowing and the gag reflex and vocalisation. Uh, and it's an, a, the, the big thing is about its involvement in an anti-inflammatory pathway, which has only recently been found out, but it has direct connection through three anti-inflammatory pathways mm -hmm. throughout the body. And uh, one being it activates the HPA axis uh, without the stress response. So it hasn't got all the secondary stress response effects, but it does have to activate the HPA axis. So you get an anti-inflammatory effect through cortisol, yep. through that one. You also activate this other one through um, a ciliac ganglion in the gut, uh, and that activates uh, lymphocytes in the spleen to release acetylcholine on macrophages. And this is a really interesting interaction. So when the lymphocytes release acetylcholine onto splenic macrophages, the macrophages are inhibited from releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, particularly TNF-alpha. Yep. So oh. it's involved on that anti-inflammatory response. But the most amazing one, which I, which is where I started, is its role on the gut lining. Right. So it directly via, di directly is a poor term there, it, via uh, inter enteric interneurons and neurons, it releases acetylcholine onto gut mucosal and gut lining macrophages and has the same effect. It's 
stops it from producing TNF alpha and interleukin one, and as an effect, they say that potentially interleukin six as well. Right. So you've got this huge anti-inflammatory effect, which has huge potential for things relating to inflammatory bowel disease yeah. and also rheumatoid arthritis. So all these autoimmune conditions, that's where a lot of that particular cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, that's where they're sort of uh, pointing the research into those areas. But that's the next step is really more in that area. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking about IBD certainly right now with TNF-alpha and um, well, interleukin-1b. And, um, yep. That's really amazing. Mm. Uh, 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 can I but, ask then, is this a measured effect? Like you can you can prove before and after? And Well, the... They've got um, ability to see blood levels of interleukin levels and TNF alpha levels drop mm. uh, before and after. And they've they've done this research through the pathways and found that actually it actually occurs and you know, they see the before and after changes. Mm. And and it's directly reflected into a range of other conditions. And you see it uh, in you know IBD, but also in the increased gastrointestinal uh, decrease in inflammation of the GIT in other conditions. But then you know, this this is this is the next area for research. Not to, they've, they've established those pathways. Yeah, they know that the the pathway to the macrophage and the gut lining is 100 percent established. Right. It's the other two that they're they're trying to map out better. And so the HPA axis uh, is definite. It's just that the the minor circuitry needs to be mapped out better. And it's happening. Uh, but it's it's you should see the research is 2016 and 2000 and next year. It's all occurring right now. Oh, wow. So they're establishing that at the moment. The, but the biggest research is really in change in heart rate variability and in depression because depression is one that you wouldn't expect necessarily, but they found that when they were treating people with epilepsy with the uh, device, implanted mm-hmm. device, mm-hmm. that they were all, a lot of them who had depression as well, were saying that, oh, a lot of my depression symptoms are decreasing. And this was a consistent finding throughout all the research. And so they started to look into it and they found indeed. And there there are tens and tens of, of research articles on the antidepressant effect of vagus nerve stimulation. And uh, it has been followed up with auricular transcutaneous mm. and it's having the same effect. Wow. You don't have to do the implanted device. You can have the auricular stimulation and have the same effect. And so, uh, I mean, a lot of this comes down to the circuitry. So, what they've found is that uh, it activates a couple of areas in the brainstem. So, mainly it activates a thing called the locus ceruleus. And this is our main nuclei group that uh, has extensions throughout the brain, uh, throughout the spinal cord as well and it releases norepinephrine or noradrenaline. And so when, you're act- when you activate the vagus nerve, it activates one of its nuclei group, and then onwards from that, it activates the locus ceruleus. And so when you activate the locus ceruleus, you get higher concentrations of uh, norepinephrine throughout the areas of the brain, particularly the areas in the brain that are involved in depression and lower levels of norepinephrine in depression. So uh, some of these... Um, areas that you, you, you tend to see um, uh, an increase, uh, mainly areas of the hippocampus and also in the frontal cortex. And so these areas essentially would normally see lower concentrations, and hence seeing um, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors as one of the treatment treatments. And instead of just sort of replace, you know, sort of a replacement of the uh, neurotransmitter. It upregulates the nerves and neurons that produce it. Hmm. So it's like exercising the system yeah. that is going to decrease the depressing, depressing symptoms. So another thing, another interesting thing is that they, they found that in a couple of studies, I've got some numbers, that the vagus nerve stimulation increased norepinephrine levels by 69% in the hippocampus. Wow. And 70% in the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex. Oh, sorry, over what time are we talking about? Are we talking about an, an immediate increase or are we talking over a treatment phase? Over uh, an immediate increase and progressively over treatment phase as well. It actually works an immediate change and also people get it while they're doing it. Yeah. So the levels go up while they're doing it and then after. 
of course, there's that step starting stimulation and then you get the secondary effect after. And then over time, these neur- neurons actually get stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm-hmm. And so the baseline levels will will improve and so therefore the percentage increase will decrease. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's really interesting. Like this is just way out. Like I'm, I'm just forgive me. Well, I'm just clicking on a couple of papers, and I don't know the significance of them. But I'm just looking here about you know, uh, GABAergic and cholinergic. Yeah. So that's <clears throat> the we haven't even got to the GABA effects. There, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. The I'll add. I'll add just add to the noradrenaline because the picture is not complete because we haven't talked about serotonin. Ah, so yes. serotonin nuclei group uh, is the RAPA nuclei. And the dorsal wrapper nuclei sit very relatively close to the locus ceruleus. And of course, the vagus nerve doesn't directly stimulate the, rapa, the dorsal wrapper nucleus, uh, or rapa nuclei, but it does via the locus ceruleus. So, what, what tends to happen is, is that the secondary effect is the same in that serotonin levels go up as well as norepinephrine levels go up. But it's only because the locus ceruleus gets activated. If that didn't happen, you wouldn't. Uh, get the change of serotonin. Now, unfortunately, though, serotonin changes occur two weeks later. So right. it takes time. It takes time. So that's why and is, you it, know, it, adherence to treatment is so important. Is that only in the brain or what about in the gut? Yes, it's brain only. Brain, brain. only. Brain. So yep. they, well, they only assess brain. So oh, right. I don't know if, of what's going on in the gut at the same time. But, you know, we, we tend to simplify with neurotransmitters. We say, oh, this neurotransmitter does this and this neurotransmitter does this. The thing is that depending on where it is in the body, mm. it does very different things. Yeah. You know, we, we know that serotonin has an anti nociceptive effect in the, in the spinal cord, in the brain, uh, particularly the spinal cord, sorry, and then in the peripheral um, system, the peripheral nervous system, it actually is a pro-inflammatory. Mm. So it, it just depends on where we're talking about. Mm. So... Yeah, and it's it, always and important to be aware of that, yeah. So what about its utility with things like irritable bowel syndrome where there may be dysregulation of of serotonin um, receptors in the gut? Because what is it, 1, 4, 7 and whatever else? Um, with, <coughs> with that hasn't been to from my knowledge. Okay, because wow, because that's really think, interesting. Well, think about it like this, and, and this is unfortunately a little bit broad, um, but it's a good starting point. If we consider that the maintenance of the tissues of the gut lining uh, maintained by um, vagus nerve, mm. if we also consider that the gut's afferent or the sensory input receptors is for inflammation, it's uh, how much pressure there is, all the different receptors in the, in the actual gut go through, or the majority of the gut, uh, the, the first portions of the gut go through the vagus nerve. Then you have the amount of activity as far as peristalsis is concerned. Mm. So a lot of it from a neurogenic perspective, neurological perspective, is mediated by the vagus nerve. If you don't have enough activity in the vagus nerve, it could you could surmise that a lot of those neurotransmitter problems is sort of a secondary effect. You could say that, but there's not enough research to back that up yet because it's not been looked at from my understanding. Gotcha. I wish it has. I would love to answer that and go, yes, <laughs> but, we have uh, it. We have I'm... it. I t- talking about peak in my interest because, like, my mind's going every which way. I'm talking about, like, what about chronic um, regional pain syndrome? What about um, <clears throat> um, hyperhidrosis? Well, There's so many, so many areas. So that- I've got a few things that just to peak some interest, just to confuse you even more. And a lot of this we don't know why. But mm. uh, okay, so over, a, I think it's over a course, a treatment course. I can't remember the months. Uh, a lot of them are done over months, and mm. it's very important to remember that. Depending on what, it's a lot of it's the device that's implanted. Yeah. Now, again, it's been shown that time after time that transcutaneous can work just as well, yep. if not better, because of the least, less side effects. Side effects. Yeah. Uh, it's shown to decrease cluster headache severity and frequency, and that's been that was in um, 2015 cephalgia, uh, the um, publication. Yeah. It also decreases interleukin 17 um, alpha for inflammatory cytokine, uh, seen after myocardial ischemia. And so there's a whole heart effect we haven't even gone into. Uh, vagus nerve also, vagus nerve stimulation also has an effect on autism. Wow. And it's shown to, at this point, only modest but definite behavioral improvements. Modest is better than nothing. Well, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's also when you utilize 
uh, vagus nerve stimulation in combination with rehabilitation exercises, it actually... So if you have a, a group that has been doing rehabilitation for, say, a limb or whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, mm. and then you have a group that's having VNS done at the same time, uh, I believe the study was using auricular. Uh, and a lot of them actually use a take-home device, so that we'll go into the use of take-home devices, uh, and doing the re- same rehabilitation exercises. Yep. The group that did the VNS as well as the, the compared to the no VNS group, they had a far greater representation of the area being moved in the brain post-rehab. So that means that the motor cortices had a more clear and bigger representation of the region being rehabilitated. Right. So what you tend to see, you see this changes in the brain, the motor cortex with chronic pain and, and, and alike. And when you see that there's a change in the representation of that area, it becomes more... Uh, spe- specified, more specific to that, you know, what you tend to see, for example, if you've got a hand, chronic hand pain, and you've got one finger involved, well, you see a merging of multiple fingers in that region of the brain. So it tends to become more broad the symptoms associated with the motor areas. So that issue means that we can modulate the amount of neuroplasticity and upregulate that, mm, mm. increase it by doing vagus nerve stimulation with the rehabilitation. Wow. But you'd never think you'd do that, right? No. And that's, that goes back to other studies that show massive increases in brain-derived neurotrophic factor oh, after right. vagus nerve stimulation. Right. So that fits. Yep. Because you've got the stimulant there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i got to say, like, uh, um, are you aware of the um, Swinburne University neuropsychoimaging um, department with Andrew Scully, Professor Andrew Scully. I'm not sorry. Well, well being from Brisbane, I'd probably know. really, <laughs> really interesting stuff they're doing uh, um, down there. But boy, it'd be great to introduce you to them. <laughs> oh yeah, I've, wow. I've been I've been looking into some <clears throat> research options for this because, and it's just where do you go? Like, uh, I mean, for me, I've been in chronic pain, neuropathic pain, and I see a lot of opportunity there and there's a lot of research being done. Mm. I haven't discussed that yet because a lot of it's still in, in process. Mm. Uh, but if we've got locus ceruleus and, and a range of raphae nuclei being activated, well, these are parts of the descending uh, pain inhibition system, which is dysfunctional in chronic pain. So people are talking about changes in migraine. Migraine is one of the other hugely effective, uh, if you hugely um important areas to consider with vagus nerve stimulation because they've they had changes. One of the studies showed um, with non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation that a group of migrainers, uh, migraine sufferers, had a 71% um, decrease in their symptoms, sorry, rather, 71% of them had a decrease in their symptoms one hour after treatment and two hours after treatment Fifty uh, percent of them had uh, no pain at all. Wow! And you know we're talking about people who have extreme amounts of pain yeah, debilitating. in this study. Yeah, debilitating. debilitating is right. And so you know more research needs to be done because we need to see it over bigger groups mm. uh, For sure. so that we can get a better idea. But I mean these are these are fantastic results, mm. and they're they're huge results. They're not just small improvements. They're huge. So, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, I'm not saying people need to change what they're doing right now. I'm just saying what if, this could be an adjunct for a lot of different conditions. Well, look, even orthodox um, neurologists aren't really happy with the uh, uh, treatment for migraineurs. I've spoken to no. one who just said, look, he, he actually looked at um, judicious su- um, um, adjunct supplementation because his migraineurs just weren't getting the results that they were happy with from the existing mm. medications. So, I mean, no, that's right. anything that you could give them, these people are, it's not just a headache. These people are debilitated. It's, I've, I've seen yeah. one that looked like a stroke. Well, you get, you get, sometimes you get a lot of other um, neurological symptoms as well. And I, there's, a, there's a range of theories I work by, but uh, yet to be really explored in research with the way that neurons decline over time. It's, Poor use. I mean, one of the main things that I've considered is, you know, why does the vagus nerve become so problematic? And and it's not that you know people have got 
dramatic like diseases of their vagus nerve. I, I don't believe that necessarily. I just think that the amount of stress people are under these days and the amount of sympathetic tone uh, and low heart rate variability a lot of people end up having, uh, this basically will, by default, inhibit the vagus nerve. And that's not very good as far as maintaining the hardware of a neuron. So when nerves don't get fired off regularly, they actually decline. They don't necessarily die, but they decline. So yep. then they become less effective at firing. So you can imagine when, okay, you're chronically stressed and you inhibit your vagus nerve pathways because they just don't get used very often, okay? They don't get used enough, let's just say. Yeah. Okay. And then you have some gut inflammation and it, your, your vagus nerve senses that. But because it's not really strong in its firing pattern and its frequency of firing is lower than it should be, it ends up being a bit lagging behind on its anti-inflammatory response to that. So what you'll see is that the vagus nerve works kind of like a negative feedback loop with mm. gut inflammation. If the inflammation goes up, the vagus nerve senses that through afferent it sends through and then efferent output through the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, we've already mentioned, yep. and blocks the release of uh, the cytokines, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you, you're seeing this modulation of the inflammation levels so it doesn't get out of control. But what you see is it does get out of control in a lot of people. And it could be the re- the, one of the reasons why. It's very difficult to ascertain where it's starting, where is it that they've got low vagal tone or they've just got too much sympathetic tone. Mm. It's probably a bit of both. Right. Can I, can I ask, is there any way other than, and I don't even know if the implantable device does it, but is there any way of assessing whether vagal tone might be low? Yeah, so <clears throat> you've got to get heart rate variability checks. Right. So generally speaking, that's, that's the gold standard for vagal tone. Okay, and I know that's a heart-related test. But if you Vaser, see vagal, whether your syncope, heart rate, yeah. yeah. So if your heart rate variability is lower, uh, that's sort of indicative of high sympathetic and low vagal tone. Right. So higher sympathetic and low vagal tone. So yeah. you want higher heart rate variability. And so in in our clinic, um, you can use a, a software called HeartMath. That's a a useful one. Uh, but we do other tests as well. You can do other tests that give you a, a broader picture. So you can look at bowel sounds as a clinician. Mm-hmm. You can look at bowel sounds and see whether uh, they have, you know, the loudness, the tone, the regularity there. If it's disorganized, um, if it's, you know, they're not, the sounds are maybe under 30 per minute or less, uh, that might indicate, or discoordination of them, that might indicate some vagal nerve problems. Uh, breath rate, it's difficult with respiratory rate because a lot of factors in respiratory rate. I mm. wouldn't use that as a primary test. Another one is um, gag reflex. And you hear in the literature that a lot of people um, don't tend to have much of a gag reflex. Uh, so when you touch the soft palate at the back of the throat, uh, it for gag reflex. Now, I do wonder whether that is because there's a lot of people with low vagal tone or, you know, that may not be the best test alone. Uh, another one is the ability to lift the uvula. So, you know, when your doctor says, ah, oh, yeah. and you, you, they depress their tongue. And so the ability of the uvula to elevate is, is vagus nerve uh, mediated. Uh, huh. So that, that might be a test that I use in conjunction with others. And to me, it's all about everything together. Yeah. And if it all starts to show a theme, I start to say, okay, you've got your vagus nerve is less active than ideal. Another one I didn't mention is vocal cord exams. So you, I've had, I had a few patients in the past, and people don't come to see me for vocal problems, but they start, it's, it's, it's a bit anecdotal, I know, but they, they, all their problems started around similar time, and some of them as opera singers. They stopped being able to sing, mainly because they couldn't go from high, like low to high notes. Mm. They, they found that it was difficult, and they didn't know why. No one could figure out why, and there was no problem when they're, uh, vocal cords that they could see on scans and, and, and examination. And then it turns out that they've actually got low vagal tone. And so that actually fits that it could have been the fact that the vagus nerve somehow was inhibited and it affected their vocal production, their vocalization. And so a lot of them, their symptoms, their secondary symptoms, which they come to see me, or maybe it's a inflammatory problem, a um, depression, for example, mm. 
they come to see me for maybe that, but that all started around the same time. So it's that never well since principle, and uh, and it, it may well be a may well have started with Vegas. Mm. Uh, I can't prove it, but it seems to me that I've seen it multiple times, and it all seems to come about when their vocal chords change. So can I ask with regards to that? I, I, and the reason is because there's a she wasn't a patient; it was a sort of friend of a friend. Um, so somebody who just had something horrible, a horrible life experience happened to her. And from that moment mm. on, she could only speak in a whisper. Now, back uh, then yes. in my nursing days, um, it, you know, I had no idea. I just, well, I was psychosomatic. Um, I'm mm. wondering, I don't know. Um, obviously, you know, this is an old past tense sort of exam example, but I just mm. wonder if, do you find any correlation with stressful events with these sort of singers? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Uh, yeah, and so yeah. my presumption, like I said before, you have a stressful event, you have this exaggerated sympathetic response. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not well controlled by, maybe you already had a bit of a low level, low um, activity in your vagus nerve, who knows, but the, the ability to regulate that stress response maybe wasn't there. For whatever reason it was, it inhibited your uh, vagus nerve and your parasympathetic nervous system as a whole. And that, that happens on a chemical level. It's not just because it's not activating. It's, it happens on a chemical level because uh, the norepinephrine gets released on presynaptic cells, so they actually inhibit the presynaptic cells of, of sciences. And so over time, if you keep inhibiting it, it's just going to downregulate it. Yeah. And so it, it finds it much harder to activate. And so it would make sense that in extreme cases, some people actually go to the point where their vocal cords don't work as well yeah. because the vagus nerve outflow is so reduced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I could definitely presume that. Huh. Um, you, when you were talking about uh, the um, bowel sounds and borborygmus, I guess is part of that. But um, or yeah. it's more it's more of a pathognomonical sound. But um, uh, something that interested me or, or tweaked my interest, and in that was, do you find a great confusion if you just looked at bowel sounds with something something like um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, SIBO? Um, well, do you well, differentiate yeah, there, or is there a link, or yeah, so I would, like I said, unfortunately, these tests are never really good by themselves. Mm. I would never, I'd never use them by themselves. So any abnormality I see there, I what I tend to do is I think more functionally, okay? Because I'm not really, I don't work on SIBO directly. I, I mean, I do, but I don't. Mm. I, the way I see it is I'm going, my main role, because uh, I work a lot with natu- uh, uh, with Ananda Mahoney, you've uh, yep. talked to her previously. Yep. Okay. And so we'll tend to work on these together. So my role in that whole, picture is not to treat necessarily the SIBO directly. I'll treat it by improving the hardware. Again, my, my role is to update the hardware, you know, and update the software, the, the hardware works yeah. better. Yeah. So it's all about improving the neural connection there so that everything that occurs there will happen more efficiently. And so whatever intervention that the naturopath or the clinical nutritionist might have should work better. Yeah. Because it does it, it relies upon the vagus nerve actually working. If it doesn't work, well it may not be as effective and that may be why some people don't respond i mean that i presume that i don't i don't know that for sure but it could be a reason so you mentioned before that there were some simple at home techniques that people can use yep. can you take our listeners through some yep. of those all right so what i tend to give my patients these are pretty easy to do um one is singing is an interesting one yep. um a lot of people don't like singing i, I always i always sort of explore why you don't like singing i love but singing my family <laughs> hates me singing yeah. <laughs> well, that's the tricky thing with singing. Um, and it's only in particular places yeah. you can do it, of course. Uh, so singing is a good one. It's, you can join singing groups. It sounds strange. I know that, you know, the fact that I put needles in someone's ear and I'm affecting their gastrointestinal tract is very strange. But th- this whole vagus nerve stimulation is very, you know, novel. <laughs> it's, um, I, and, and so one of them is, yes, yeah, singing, particularly if you can do high to low tones, not just, you know, sort of monotone type singing or anything like that. Get in there, and I, I think in, in part I prefer more um, classical singing, if, if possible. It's not just maybe uh, more of a training as far as doing a range of of levels of uh, tones and so yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's also good to do it in groups because you know you actually get in a bit of um, social interaction. A lot, a lot of people I deal with in chronic pain. They don't really have a connection to, the, to sort of social connection sometimes, yep. and, and sometimes it's their social problems that are causing part of their problem. Mm. And so getting them into singing groups is actually a strange but really novel way of actually 
getting them out there, meeting new people, enjoying it, but also doing something else, Absolutely. actually stimulating their value snow. Yeah. Um, another one that's really easy to do is gargling. And a lot of people say, oh, I can't gargle. I said, well, we're going to have to try. Mm-hmm. And eventually people do. And, and not being able to gargle is another sign of it, of, of a low vagal tone. It's not in the literature because it's such a, it's a difficult thing to measure. Uh, so that's why heart rate variability is gold standard. So we always go back to that. But gargling is a really good way. And what I tend to say to people, if you can gargle as long as possible yeah, uh, and then and, and sit out, because most people can only gargle for a minute or two. And then that's it. Um, and, and do that multiple times a day. And again, it's kind of tricky if you're at work, how are you going to do that? Uh, we've got to go to the bathroom and start gargling. Um, but that's what they've got to do. Could do it at um, the pub, but it's not really congenial. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive to be doing it with the with the, boots, with yeah. the beer. Um, that's right. <laughs> and then swallow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the other one is the gag reflex. Now, I mean, I don't do this for everyone, but eliciting the gag reflex with like some like a steel spoon or yeah. uh, some of the tongue depressor if they have it available. It's not for everyone. A lot of people get really irritated by it, and uh, it's not something that can be easily elicited in some people. So it's something we start with a gargling move to that maybe. Yeah, uh, it's that's quite that that can be very effective. It can be very effective from a as far as a motor exercise, as far as a, an intervention. Yeah. Um, another one that I do, which you don't read about very often, but I think it's worth doing as an adjunct to, to the other ones, is just getting a little uh, cotton tip and just lightly tickling. It sounds, again, another odd one, tickling the just the outside of your ear canal, not pushing it inside, but just, at, just outside of it. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, I really like pointing it, poking it in my ear, I go, oh, that's it's odd. We always used to think that's quite odd. Mm. Maybe that's because of the vagus nerve. It's my presumption. Yeah. Um, another thing I didn't mention is actually increases dopamine levels in the brain because it activates the ventral tegmental area uh, on functional MRI. So dopamine levels go up as well. So yeah. maybe that's another little so that's you know, why they like it. dopamine release. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we... Can we put up um, a diagram of this intervention up on the FX Medicine website? Have you got a diagram? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. I can put that together and put it up for you. Great. That'd be wonderful. Because like, there's a whole lot of research I think that needs to go up. I'm just looking at three papers here and I'm going, wow. <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> oh, look, it's immense. It is. It's immense. Yeah. If you go into ResearchGate, it's over 5,000. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so um, I was going to go into that. What kinds of research and evidence exist? I mean, you know, I've just found three, and I'm going. I, n- I've never looked for this. I've n- no way I've ever stumbled across this. Uh, so, like I've already mentioned, you've got a lot in various different um, publications. Uh, brain stimulation. I mentioned cephalgia, uh, in neurostimulation um, uh, journals. They're all getting on board with this, and the. The research that I've sort of indicated, all of the sort of stats that I'm talking about come from research, mm. come from uh, a lot of them are, are using heart rate variability as one of their ways of assessing the vagal tone as well. Right. The research in that is pretty uh, gold standard for me. Yep. Uh, and, and then the research into migraines is getting is getting up there. Depression has pretty much, besides epilepsy, depression has the best research. And so if you go in and look at the numerous papers available. I can I can make sure that your listeners, uh, I, I can upload as many papers as you need. Yeah, there's, beautiful. There's so many. And and some of them look at, as I said, like concentration changes in, of norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine. And But some also look at brain changes. So they look at the neuroplasticity effects, and which are hippocampal in most, pa- in most part. And some of them even look at how, ma- how many like the firing pattern of neurons before and after. So you'll see things like locus ceruleus neurons start spiking in their uh, their action potentials, and they'll go into burst firing. Mm. And that's that's needed for huge amounts of norepinephrine release. And, and I don't want people to think, you know, norepinephrine and noradrenaline, let's call it, release is not a negative when it comes to depression. Uh, it's lo- in low levels generally. In it's depression. low levels, so that, yeah. It's, and it's not, yeah, it's not something that, people need to worry about as far as the sympathetic response. It's That's like I said, sometimes norepinephrine is used in a positive light, mm. you know, not just to do with stress. It's also used for focus. It's used for, you know, us to orientate our attention to something. And 
you see that with people low norepinephrine, they've just got this sort of, they're distracted, they're unable to focus, they've got brain fatigue sometimes, you could say that, right. brain fog. And, and that's in part due to the lower norepinephrine levels. Uh, it can also be just the neural connectivity. And, and that's what depends how you want to talk about it. Do you want to talk on a neurochemical level or a neurocircuitry level? And there are a whole different group of scientists that are doing the research on either. So the more they talk to each other, the better that those two bits of re, you know, research groups are going to get um, yeah. together, the better the, our understanding, I find. You, you just perhaps cleared up something in my brain about the difference between SSRIs and SNRIs, the serotonin oh, yeah. noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, <clears throat> and you know, which yep. obviously keep the noradrenaline there because their reuptake is inhibited. So um, that's right. Th- yeah, so that that's really interesting to me. So uh, they are uh, effective, but they have got problems. Yeah, as well. oh, yeah, like a lot of people aren't. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so you've mentioned depression. You've mentioned migraine, yep. cluster headaches. Um, yeah. even autism, and mm. certainly neuro- neuropathic pain. Um, what yeah. other conditions might be helped by transcutaneous ne- um, vagal stimulation? Um, okay, so uh, there's, there's been some research done on changes in heart rhythm. Mm. So people who have got atrial fibrillation have demonstrated um, uh, sort of resolution of the atrial fibrillation after vagus nerve stimulation. And that's sort of also reflected in their heart rate variability levels as well. That sort of coincides there. And I've been treating a lot of people with atrial fibrillation. Some, and most of the case I've, I've asked, you know, a lot of them are idiopathic. They don't really know why or there's just maybe the doctors said, you know, keep on these blood thinners or, or whatever the, the actual intervention they've got. Yeah, blockers, but they're yeah. not, they're still, they're still got it, right? And, uh, you know, it, it's only on a clinical anecdotal level, but everyone's having success. Everyone's like, all well, their, uh, they don't get any spikes. It, it's well regulated and it stays that way. And I find that people, I had one girl, it was a very interesting case. Every time she went to bed, her heart would race. And, uh, you know, she was a friend of mine, it was really early in my. Um, use of vagus nerve. And I thought, all right, well, let, let's try to stimulate it and see what happens. Mm. So we did it and it improved the first time. The second time we did it, which is about a week later, and she'd been experiencing this for weeks, mm. you know, and, and we didn't know why and the doctors didn't know either. And we did it again and it completely diminished. To, to, it didn't exist anymore. Wow. And, and a few weeks later, it slowly crept back. We mm. did another session and it hasn't come back since. And that was months ago now. And that's, that's one example of where you don't really know why it's there. They can't really find a reason. I mean, I'm sure if you look deeper, you know, you go to other specialists and you'll find a reason why, you know, it's happening. But just, just a little novel treatment like that can have a huge effect on heart rhythm. Mm. And, and not in a negative way, like people may presume. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk out there about some vagal nerve stimulators having negative effect on the heart rhythm, but there's not credible evidence for that, and yeah. it, it's not consistent. And it certainly, if it is occurring, it will be happen. It'll happen with the, excuse me, it'll happen with the implanted device. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that's poorly, partly because it's the lack of control over the the stimulation. And it depends on the implanted device you have as well. Right. So psoriasis is not really obvious in the literature. But, you know, the, the links between gut inflammation and psoriasis are there. And I've been treating a range of patients with psoriasis in conjunction with Ananda, and we're getting fantastic results. I mean, I, I don't only use vagus nerve stimulation. That's something in, I haven't even talked about the other therapies I do with photobiomodulation and intracranial low-level laser. Uh, but using low-level laser in conjunction with vagus nerve stimulation is far more effective than one alone. Mm. So it's important that, you know, with skin conditions for me, I, I don't just use vagus nerve stimulation, but you can still get an effect. Mm. It's just that if you can do a skin intervention, direct skin intervention with the you know, low-intensity laser and an anti-inflammatory effect on the body, it's a better effect overall because you're working from the inside out and the outside in. Yeah, so. but, but the vagal nerve stimulation with the low-light laser that's not. That's... No, it's not. That's not. That's not for the vagus nerve. Oh right, so forgive me. Yeah, I was just directly thinking directly on the lesions uh, on the skin. Right uh, for the psoriasis, and we also use it for depression. So, 
Low-level lasers used on areas of the brain that are less active in depression. Mm. Mm. And the the difficulty with low-level laser on the on the head is that you've got to get through the cranium. And, and it does work. It gets through. But you've got to put a large amount of energy in to get a small amount of energy onto the cortex. Yep. And that's showing really promising results in the research. It's not quite at its fullest yet with this, like some, in, in as far as how vagus nerve is. But... I've found it incredibly effective. So I use the both of them together because I may as well. I may as well be more effective overall. Yeah. Um, so any caveats with therapy, particularly with, like, you know, you're mentioning a lot, a lot of energy in the laser to get through the cranium. Any issues with that? Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of conjecture in the literature about it. So we don't know whether, you know, the exact number, we think it's somewhere between two and four joules on the cortex for 60 joules being applied. Uh, there's a lot of lasers being used out there that their quality isn't quite to the level that we'd want them to be. And mm. so we don't know whether they're accurate as far as how many joules they're using. And so the parameters are a bit vague, but there is definite uh, change as far as the analysis of um, depression symptoms. Uh, the the issue is also the, the interesting things we see with vagus nerve stimulation and sort of difficulties are getting patients to understand the importance of it and understanding why why am I working on the ear to affect these other areas. Yeah. It's conceptually very difficult. And, you know, the, the, to teach someone in five minutes how neuro, the nervous system works and how an afferent in the ear can be an efferent in the gut. You yeah. can't really – it's very difficult for people to get that mm. and how the ear treatment is going to affect their depression symptoms. I've worked pretty hard on getting the wording right with them. And in most part, you know, 99% of the time, people are, are right on board. Yeah. Because people want another option, you know, and, and that's, and it's, it's a novel way. It's a really, it's a very non invasive, it's not going to make them feel like they're doing something that's dangerous that could be potentially harmful or anything because it's, it's so innocuous. Yeah. Uh, a couple of meals in the year. Um, the hard thing is, is, is getting the right dose. So, you know, you can't be in every day getting vagus and stimulation. You can, but it's unaffordable. It's not really yeah. affordable. No, no, it's not practical. So it, for me, it's generally speaking, it's a couple of times a week is good. And then once you get stable, once a week, and then it's like anything every few weeks and then to the point where your your vagus nerve is, is very active and you can maintain it with the gargling and, and things like that. Yeah. And, all, you know, all, I, I get that, you know, we covered the issues with, um, the, you know, the cl sort of clip that I mentioned before, but could it get to a stage where people, you know, because of affordability or home, home, you know, preference for home treatment, whatever, that they become trained enough to be able to use that um, clip device? Yeah, so in America, there's patents pending, uh, not patents pending, rather, the, the, there's certain products that are about to be released mm -hmm. that are take-home devices, mm -hmm. and some of them are medically prescribed, some of them are not. Uh, some of them report that one's called Nirvana, and it actually is this little earbud that you can play music and at the same time get electrical stimulation. Right. And it actually gives – it. Tell, they say that it gives you the feeling of Nirvana, you know, so right. it actually gives you this sort of euphoric sensation. And that's been approved for sale. Wow. Uh, that's one stimulator, but that's a very sort of marketed one. Yeah. It's not very medical. Yeah. In Europe and in America, there's also handheld devices that are placed on the neck. Uh, some are also placed on the ear. And the ones on the ear are tricky just because of the shape of the ear. Um, the handheld ones are easier. Mm. And, and a lot of the research is done with those. Right. Yeah, so that, that'll eventually get to Australia. Um, I'm trying to acquire some of them. Uh, it's just too difficult at the moment. Yeah. But eventually, you will be able to do it from home, which is ideal because, you, you know, you, most of these stimulators are not – too intensive, mm. so you, you can get a good response if you do it for a long period of time. Yeah, it's like going to the gym. You know, you can go once and not really get much of an effect, but if you go over the course of months, you get a big effect. Yeah, that's right. And that's yeah. how you have to look at it. Yeah, I got to say, this is so extremely interesting to me. Like, I, I feel really ignorant. I've got to say. <laughs> so, where oh, where can it was help... me at the start of uh, <laughs> my, my first start of this? Yeah. Hey, well, I got to say, you must have been sitting there blinking a bit. That's. I know it's too good to be true. I thought it was too good to be true. Yeah. I really did. But but the paper upon paper upon paper, and and I've been talking to a lot of the researchers, and and they're uh, they're really excited. It's like a really it's like 
we've got something here. This is like the future yeah. of medicine in, in, with a lot of areas. Yeah. And it's just that we have to refine it and perfect it. Yep. And it's it's a lot of them are really, really there. Like with depression, you know, it's like with trans, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Like a lot of people have heard of it and a lot of people don't get it. Mm. Uh, but it's really effective. That's another, another therapy for depression. Mm. There's a lot of things out there that are not drug therapies that are really effective. Mm. And I think that the more of the of these we have, the more you know, options there are for patients and, and then as far as they don't just have to fall into drug therapy alone. Yeah, well, I, look, I, I think particularly with something, you know, like um, recalcitrant depression, which is a real issue, even if this was yeah. an adjunct, you know, I mean, obviously severe depression should be medically managed and particularly if they've got suicidal ideation. But, um, yes. um, you know, even if this was an adjunct for these people, the perfect Yes, exactly. So, and then there are some anti angiolytic effects as well, mm. but the research is new in that area. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got a few patients who have anxiety as well, and they always report. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's an anti angiolytic. I'm just saying that they always report, you know, decrease in their anxiety. Yeah. So that's that's seen seen clinically, and. I'm not trying to treat that. I'm normally treating another condition. Yeah, but we'll normally, watch. you know, you'll see a lot of anxiety with chronic pain. Yeah, like that. So for sure. I might be treating like fibromyalgia or um, any any number of different uh, chronic pain conditions, and yeah, they'll start talking about other symptoms they have that are changing. So yeah. I think fibromyalgia is an interesting one because of a lot of them having gut problems, um, anxiety, depression, and the chronic pain. I think it's it's not being researched properly with vagus nerve stimulation, but mm. it's a really it's a, it's an exciting area that could that could bloom into something really cool, mm. really cool. So, yeah. where can health practitioners get training on this <clears throat> treatment? Yeah. So, at the moment, I'm I'm doing training in Brisbane uh, for my methodology. I'm not um, pretending to do anything that's in the papers that they're using these different types of stimulators. Um, it's using very simple means. But I do a range of uh, examination, um, testing and history and retesting procedures and, uh, and also understanding how to, to manually work on the vagus nerve. I haven't talked about some of the manual work you can do on it um, with your hands um, to sort of manipulate the nerve. But the, the electrical stimulation, I've been doing some training and I'm, I'm looking to do some training in Melbourne um, for clinicians at the moment, because I'm a musculoskeletal therapist and my therapist, I've really been targeting those groups of people. But yeah. the hard thing is because you're using um, needles and, and all your musculoskeletal and my therapists are trained in uh, needles, yep. needlework, so dry needling, they're, they're covered with that. you know. So it's not a problem. But when it comes to things like naturop- naturopathy and nutrition, they aren't covered for no, that kind no, of work. No, that's right. So it's, it's either that you... You have to have that qualif- some qualification that allows you to be able to do it, uh, do the training and, and further. Or And what I tend to do is I'll do the first day, I'll do it on all that stuff you can do that's not interventional, mm. you know, or it's exercises and understanding it better and how you can work with it without getting into using the skills that I'm talking about. And then the next day is about that. And so I find that, you know, I've had naturopaths come in and learn about it on the first day and and musculoskeletal therapists, and then the musculoskeletal therapists will stay for the second. And, you know, you can, if you find someone who's, who's been doing it, you know, get in a referral um, program with them and, and, and work with, you know, these conditions together. I think it's better that you don't just do this by itself. I think I always think uh, uh, working in teams is better. Mm. Athletic and physical health is, a, is a, sort of a multimodal approach to most conditions. So we have the naturopath and myself. Ananda and myself working on those things together. So we find that more effective. And, and I know that a lot of people don't have that luxury, but I can highly recommend that you, you do that. I can give you some information about potential upcoming dates. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> yep, we'll, we'll look at yes, that. <laughs> yes, please. So um, how soon are we looking at, can I ask? Uh, hopefully by the end of the year or the beginning of next year. Right, okay. Yeah, and I'm looking potentially Adelaide, but Sydney and Melbourne – just depends on interest. So at the moment, if um, some of your listeners are interested in coming for the first part of their naturopathic or nutrition or whatever, yeah. that would well suit them and, and they can get a lot out of it. And uh, the next day, you know, if someone's already got – even people have got acupuncture as their background, they can 
because they've got training with needles and electrostimulation a lot of the time, they can get get it on this as well. Yeah. So yeah. So what's the website again where they can look at further information and the dates of um, available? Yeah, so I'll be I'll be um, putting up some dates on my uh, clinic website for now. I'm I'm creating a new website for training mm. at the moment. Um, I'm just using my own uh, website. So athleticofphysicalhealth.com.au. Yep. And uh, just look up the tab for training. Great. So yep. we'll we'll put that website up on the on the FX Medicine website. Um, so that practitioners can access that. And uh, and yeah, look forward to um, seeing what uh, the further uh, revelations of research in this area. This is really exciting. This is really yeah, quite unique. Well, I'll post. I'll we'll post up you know a, a fair amount of them, and then do another look through and make their own judgment on them and 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 and, and so on. But they're it, it's it's extremely exciting, and, and it's interesting how many different conditions have been affected by vagus nerve being activated, uh, and it, it might indicate a, a big part of a lot of chronic conditions and why. We need to add this in as another therapy in, in the treatment and management of a lot of chronic problems. Absolutely awesome. Emrys, thank you so much for joining us at FX Medicine today. This is really quite mind-blowing to me. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite stunned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I look forward to, to seeing what revelations there are in the future. Really, really um, look forward to hearing from you again. Great. Thanks, Andrew. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Today's podcast is brought to you by Isoway Sports, the sports range for athletes looking for supplements that are free from all artificial colours, flavours, sweeteners and added fructose. Intense physical training programs place significantly higher nutritional demands on sports people and Isoway Sports are committed to providing pure nutritional ingredients that are truly complementary to a healthy, active lifestyle. You can visit isoasports.com.au for more information.